This study is the first of a series of interventions designed to restore the visual component of one of Jacques Lacan's most visual seminars, Seminar 13, entitled The Object of Psychoanalysis. This seminar has not been officially translated. What we have is the labor of love of a much-admired Irish psychoanalyst, Cormac Gallagher, who has provided English-speaking readers with many texts to which they would otherwise not have any access. We owe Gallagher our thanks, but the disadvantage of these translations is that they do not include the graphics that the French transcripts and publications do. In this particular seminar, the lack of graphic aids is not just detrimental. It is catastrophic. So anyone wishing to make the best of an already difficult task must go back and forth between the Gallagher translation and whatever French texts there are to be found. My project is to restore graphics for selected sessions, beginning with session 18, the last of my series, and working forward. This first installment focuses on one particular diagram in session 18, Lacan's lecture given on May 18, 1966, with interventions by André Green, a psychoanalyst, and Xavier Odwar, a former Jesuit and also former patient of Lacan's. Odwar angers Lacan with his interpretation of Lacan's famous diagram concerning the gaze, which had been presented two years earlier in Seminar 11, The Four Fundamental Concepts of Psychoanalysis. This was the second of Odwar's diagrams, however, and the irony is that poor Odwar had just presented a diagram that resolved many of Lacan's concerns, and went further to revise the usual way of reading this diagram. The standard interpretation was to see the figure as a lateral intersection of two opposite triangles, but Odwar's new reading involved flips between the central position of the viewer and the limits of the field of view, both at the horizon in the distance and around the viewer as well. The usual way of reading Lacan's famous diagram of the look and the gaze is to conceptualize both as opposed triangles that can merge. This is a rather Jungian interpretation, one which presumes the prior existence of the look and gaze, each with their own pre-existing spaces, with the merger resulting in the production of an ambiguous entity, belonging to both or neither, the image screen. Odwar's revised diagram didn't seem to clarify any confusions of this Jungian reading. Rather, it added complications by describing the vertical line on the right side triangle as the horizon, which annoyed Lucon. And having rays that Lucon described as optical, converted to visual rays converging on single points, and then radiating out to the vertical sides on each triangle. Not only did this annoy Lucon, it was contrary to the graphical model he had just presented, which more interestingly made the radiating lines parallel. The A prime and A double primes were parallel, likewise the beta prime and beta double primes. This forced Odwar to create a vague, or at least ambiguous element, the interval labeled A, behind the bigger tree, to explain away the seeming contradiction of reversed perspective, one tree diminishing from the viewer's position, behind which towers a larger tree, belonging to the field of the gaze. Odwar's first graphic, however, saw this merger diagram in an entirely different light. The problem was that Odwar presented a mass of lines, with labels that were hard to interpret. His accompanying explanation did little to explain the relations of the alpha and beta lines, or the significance of the diagonals running across the oval shapes. More problematic was the alpha line separating the two ovals orthogonally. This was, ambiguously, labeled the infinity line, which obscured the fact that Odwar was actually suggesting that the two planes were originally a single entity that had been cut in two, and then separated. If we pay attention to the paired alpha and beta lines, which run parallel to each other, we can begin to reason why Odwar also drew a horizon mirror line in the oval on the left, the plane of looking at, in a parallel position to the horizon running diagonal on the plane of the figure. Now, it becomes possible to see that the infinity line is about connecting a first state of congruency and overlap, to a second state of separation. But, we also see that Odwar has run the film in reverse. Instead of seeing two independent triangles converging, we see an original whole that is cut in two and then separated. The infinity line is the timelessness between these two states, as if to say that we can view the same situation in a closed or open position, but in the open position shown here we are able to realize the relation of looking at and the figure 
as something created by the crisscross of two parallelograms, the alpha and beta parallelograms. This is an entirely original way of seeing things, and Lacan underestimates Odor's insight on this point. By starting with the instance of a cut that happens as soon as we intend to look at or do something, Odor is able to speak of the conceptual moments that occur outside of the time that will, thanks to this timelessness, result in a temporalized experience. The single oval is cut in two, creating two faces that are looking at each other. The two parallelograms cross to show us how this interior look and gaze, which are actually synonymous, relate. The infinity line, in fact, shows that there is a void between the look and the gaze, a void that is both conceptual and active. Lacan has himself treated this void in terms of a crisscross that is also an inside out, in his Euler diagram, of the situation known as union without intersection, which we can find represented as the theme of irony throughout art and popular culture. In the story written by the American author, O. Henry, a poor couple who want to give each other Christmas gifts must each sell the thing that the other has intended to augment. The wife cuts and sells her beautiful long hair to buy a gold chain for the watch that her husband has sold to buy her an expensive hair comb. The Euler diagram represents this in a way that connects to another reference in this session of the seminar, the diagram discovered by Pappus of Alexandria, where we see the idea of the infinity line as central to Pappus's discovery of projective geometry. But we also recognize graphically that the two overlapping parallelograms have constructed the identical diagram Lacan had drawn two years earlier, which we had until now interpreted as two triangles moving to join in an overlap. Now, instead of joining two separate things, the look and the gaze, we are cutting into something and seeing the two internal faces of this cut, a left hand and right hand version of what we can more accurately at this point label as a catagraphic cut that is, actually, a cut that defines the material it cuts into. Javier Odor is putting forward an ambitious thesis. He is saying that the viewer's own limitations, which on the side of the look, are the limits of peripheral vision and the difference between looking forward and not seeing behind oneself, is identical to the horizon that bounds the space in front of the viewer. The two invisible zones are both antipodal and the same, and this meets the criteria of projective space in general, that is, non-orientation and self-intersection. The line at infinity, which is defined in the original diagram as the image screen, is really a point in the middle of the two halves when they are rejoined as two sides of a single cut. This is, indeed, a revolutionary way of reinterpreting Lacan's original diagram of the gaze. Because the gaze travels through this central point, which is a void, it is capable of putting into effect the transfer that we met up with in the O'Henry story, but we see it as two circuits running in opposite directions. They separate, to create a dramatic space, where the couple are worried about what to get each other for Christmas. At this point, they experience lack individually, each from his or her own side. The denouement of the story comes when the circuits come together again when they leave the Euclidean space that has immersed the husband and wife separately, to the projective space where the void is realized as both self-intersecting and non-orientable. This condition, of symmetrical difference, allows us to see how the two ovals that were the product of a cut, were really the two faces of a cut that occurred in two directions at the same time. This palindrome of pure difference makes this story about a truer, kind of gift, the kind of gift that speaks, beyond itself to the act of pure giving, which is by definition the condition of intentional lack. In effect, Lacan's critique of Odor was correct, but Odor had managed to both anticipate this critique and go beyond it, to create an entirely new way of conceptualizing Lacan's concept of the drive in a more general way, as a topology of self-intersection and non-orientation. What had been missing in the graph of Seminar 11, and what was even more obvious in this seminar, was the necessity of projective topology in relation to the object small a, which Lucon over and over again connects to the real, and which he theoretically links to the condition of lack, and the inevitable falling short of the subject's demand in relation to the other. But the other is, just a structure, and the structure is also the real for Lucon, a structure that is tied to the function of the unary trait. In seminar 14, 
Lacan will connect this definitively to non-orientation that is mathematically represented by regression. We can see this mathematically with the paradigm of x equal to 1 plus 1 over x. But, it is more fun and perhaps more instructive to model this condition after the kinds of visual paradoxes that the Dutch artist M.C. Escher produced in his bidirectional staircases. In his honor, I propose naming the immersion state of the gaze, where the void resists being represented, as an Escher construct. Odwar's genius was to see that Lacan's diagram of the gaze was a kind of tangram that was equivalent to two overlapping parallelograms. The overlap was the key difference. It allows us to connect the drive to Parpus's theorem, where the infinite line has a direct equivalence between the drive inside the drive of the gaze as a kind of demand, in relation to the real of the other. At the same time, the infinity line is what makes the Euler circles create a union without intersection. Projective space is where time and space merge, or rather where we find time and space in their original, primordial simultaneity. Where Parpus's theorem gives us a line that is a point through which other lines will pass in criss-cross fashion, the Euler diagram gives us a void where symmetrical difference will do the same thing in creating a union without intersection. The infinity line that Lucan had so much difficulty with, accusing it of being a reference to binocular vision was actually the way that the point in projective space extends to a line that is temporalized space or, rather, spatialized time. These are two views of what is actually the same condition, the point that is a line, and the line that is a point. Fantastic! We can now see the error that Odwar made that gave Lacan so much trouble. It was to portray the beta prime and beta double prime, and the alpha prime and alpha double prime, as converging instead of parallel. This destroyed his parallelogram schema, but restoring the correct designations allows us to see how the element Lucan labeled an image screen in the middle of the diagram, is actually a cut between lines that were originally the same, but are now two faces at opposite ends, the blue lines that are, on the left, the plane of the look, and on the right, the figure plane with its vanishing point, B, and its horizon, H. Because this cut is catagraphic, we know that it is what took place first, before the two planes on the right and left separated. It is now possible to return to Pappus's theorem and begin to understand it. The gist of the theorem is that the lines M and N can be at any angle, and the points big A, B, C and little a, B, C can be placed anywhere. This means that we are talking about a general spatial condition. The magic of this anywhere is that if we connect the points in criss-cross pairs, big A to little b and little a to big b and so on, the result is that the crossing points will all be on the same line. We can reverse the logic to say that the line OO prime is actually what came first, and what split apart to form all of the other possible lines in this space, making them projections of the original cut. This backwards way of thinking allows us to see how the line OO prime is really a primordial point, a void, a hollow of generation. Now, it seems like perfect sense to say that if you divide a primordial line that is a line in projective space, a kind of real, that the result is the creation of a chiralistic condition where looking at something, and the something looked at, will face each other, and that their logical connection will represent the crisscross structure that was implicit in the cut to begin with. The line connecting the two faces will be both a line and a point, both the act of separating the faces in the creation of a chiralistic left-right space, and, the void or logical origin of this space, through which all vectors will pass, crisscrossing at any angle whatsoever. This connection to Pappus's theorem might seem to be needlessly complicated, but it actually allows us to relate to many ethnographical cases where lines, points, and planes interact because there was a cut originally made to separate two things, such as twins, or kingdoms, or even single beings that were held apart forever, with no question of healing, until some magical solution was found. This is the story of Castor and Parlux, Romulus and Remus, Apollo and Daphne, and so on and so on. Lucan himself cites this last story in Seminar 7, The Ethics of Psychoanalysis, and correctly describes the role of projective geometry in the creation of a surface that traps Daphne just as soon as she decides to flee. Lucan directly refers to Pappus in session 18, enigmatically suggesting that although Pappus himself did not generalize the meaning of his theorem, 
Every era of history recognizes this projective principle in its own way, which is a certain mode of relating to the scopic world, meaning the world of the gaze, not just Euclidean parallax alone, as we might say of each age's style of looking at things differently. Lacan says that this was a relation of the cogito, as what is thought, to the unthought, and in this the object A plays the critical role. It is delightful to think that Odwar provided a means of relating the objet A to the Euler circle, symmetrical difference, and indirectly to other projective figures such as the torus, crosscap, and mobius band, thanks to his tangram of the figure from Seminar 11. In these we are set up to understand one of the key principles of projective geometry, namely that the line, the point, and the void are interchangeable. Essentially, the points of intersection on the one-dimensional subspace, in the middle of two randomly placed lines with randomly placed points, are really the same point, and if we merge them we get a graphic picture of what the object A is doing as a scopic function. The rule of equating the line, the point, and the void takes us directly to the inside-out rule of projective space, where the horizon turns into a hollow point, and all the parallel lines that had marked off vanishing points on that horizon are now vectors passing through it. This is not really such a weird idea. Everyone is familiar with how, in everyone, there are competing characters, good and evil, nice and nasty, innocent and dark. If I take a photo of the wonderful Spanish actress, Adriana Ugarte, split it into two halves, and duplicate each half to make a composite whole face, the slight asymmetries that were perhaps first unnoticed now become evident. This is the principle that no one is so good that there is not some element of evil, or so evil that there is not some element of innocence. I don't need to tell you how universal a principle this is, or how many novels, paintings, or fairy tales have been built around it. Yet, it owes its logic to the principles that Lucan has outlined in this session, and owes the same debt to Pappas that Lucan owed to projective geometry. You don't need to be good at figures to accept the idea that culture itself is in fact built on projectivity. Fantastic! You've made it to the end without passing out. In the next installments, I hope to extend these connections between Pappas's theorem, the Euler circle's union without intersection, and the elaborations made in these middle sections of this middle seminar treating the scopic as opposed to the optic idea of space. My goal is to develop the idea of a second parallax that is concealed within the ordinary parallax of Euclidean perspective. All I can say now is that, like Pappas's theorem, which appears second to Euclid but is actually the foundation of Euclid, this parallax will be foundational, and as such, it will appear in foundational stories told from time immemorial. Please try to read the restored manuscripts as they become available, and hold on tight, for they are difficult reading. But, if we find more courageous interventions such as this first one by Xavier Odwar, we will be in good hands. Above all, we must restore this visual component of Lucan's thinking to do justice to this most visual of thinkers. Without it, there can be no psychoanalysis, and no understanding of Freud's cryptic note, that psyche is extended. Knows, nothing, of, it.